Hello, I'm Gary Kemp. And I'm Guy Pratt. And we are getting ready for the next Rock on Tours Live. Yep. Join us at the iconic Battersea Power Station in London for a special screening of Quadrophenia, followed by a recording of the podcast where our guests will be director Frank Rodham and the star Phil Daniels. Unbelievably exciting, genuinely. It's happening on the evening of February the 22nd. Sign up now at rockontours.com to get exclusive pre-sale access to tickets before they go on general sale. A celebration of a British classic, Quadrophenia. See the film and join us for a special episode of Rock on Tours. All the details on the early access tickets are at rockontours.com. So get your best mod gear ready. See you then. Hello, Gary. Hello, Guy. I bought a flute. Yes, I. Uh, you said. Why? What on earth would possess you to do such a thing? Do you know, my son plays saxophone, and uh, he had to upgrade to a larger size. And I've had my eye on a flute for a long time. I just thought it would be meditative. And, you know, it's, it's, it's apparently proven that when you get to a certain age, it's really good to learn a new musical instrument. Um, good for the brain. And so, That's true. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of work on that bit, really. And I just thought, you know, this is a, a good thing, to, a good sound, you know. That's what I like about the flute. I've always liked it. You know, Peter Gabriel, um, Ian Anderson, you know. Yeah, well, also, it's great. It means the cod piece I've got you for Christmas um, will be <laughs> just the thing now. But yeah. actually, funny enough, I'll just look, because I've actually got a, a Chinese wood flute. Have you? Which, and the reason I bought that was because I went to the Shanghai Music Fair about four or five years ago, um, which is a giant NAM type thing, you know, with all the yeah. all the instrument equipment manufacturers show off their stuff. And this thing was huge. It was like eight Olympias big. It was right, massive. Right. And of Apocalypse NAM. <laughs> but and all those music fairs are basically just kids in black t-shirts shredding. Yeah. And blokes slapping yeah. bases. It's you know, if if aliens arrived on Earth during one of those music fairs, they would think that all a guitar can do is shred, yeah, and all yeah. a bass can do is. Slap. None of whom are in bands. I mean, it's all rigs of dad, right? But exactly, and but also, and they're all into that new metal. It's, it's all super chops. I mean, you know, it's a technically amazing stuff. I'm sorry, it sounds like someone digging up the road to me, yes. but it, a lot of it. But and there was this one pavilion in the middle, which was traditional Chinese instruments. And you go in and there'd just be these sort of harps and flutes playing and it was just yeah. so heavenly and restful. You had a gong uh, that's massage. That's why I have a wood flute. So, what do they call those gong yeah. massages? A gong bath. Gong bath, yes. Yeah, I didn't have time. I had a gong shower. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's why uh, f- flutes are, are woodwind because they used to be made of wood. Because, you know, they don't, they're they're not played with a reed, are they? And they're, they're made out of metal. I mean, so the, the hardest thing, I think, I, and I, the way I'm struggling on the flute is, is standing on one leg. Obviously, <laughs> but but well, I determined that my 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 Jethro Tull tribute band will play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and there will be it's going to be great. <laughs> What's the and is there a sort of flute equivalent of Bert Whedon's play in a day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we're bored. It we're bored our listeners enough with with my flute. I'll I'll let you know how it's getting on. Have you got a flute? Have you got a flute story? Tell us your favourite <laughs> flute. <laughs> We've got someone on today that is... I'm sure you could play the flute, because, I mean, 10CC were the most multi-instrumentalist band ever. Yeah. They? They, they were, in fact, every one of them could have been a band. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Without leading anyone else. Yeah, well, in fact, they were. I mean, they almost had, they had two bands sort of come together. I mean, there were two different groups of songwriters, wasn't there? Lowell Cream yeah. and Kevin Godley and Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman, who's with us today. But Graham's history goes back a lot further than 10CC, doesn't it, Guy? It does. Well, yeah, he started... He was in all sorts of very cool named bands and wrote one of the most important songs. So I don't know about you, Gary, because when when I first sort of got into music and you had to do your history, which back then only went back about 10 years, but it was like all roads lead to the Yardbirds. Yeah, that's right, yeah. That was the thing. All, you know, and and For Your Love was that... What became this iconic... It was, you know, of course, of course, it was before the internet. It was ages before I heard it. But this became this absolutely iconic fixed thing, wasn't it? For Your Love by the Yardbirds. Yeah, written by Graham Gorman. He wrote Gorman. it. He written wrote by it. Graham Gorman. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Yardbirds take up quite a few uh, pages, don't they, in Pete, Pete Frame's rock family tree. Yes, absolutely. Obviously, so, so Graham had, I think on For Your Love, Eric Clapton. Three hits. Th- yeah. Eric Clapton played oh, guitar. Right. And on the second one, Heart Full of Soul, that he wrote, he's only 18 or 17 when he's writing this. Yeah. Uh, Heart Full of Soul, he had Jeff Beck playing on. 
You know, then he wrote for the Hollies. He wrote Bus Stop for the Hollies. Um, and then, so is Pagey on the last one? There's the evil heart. Yeah, I think that's still Jeff Beck, um, yeah. I think. Uh, but we'll ask him. We can ask Graham himself. We can ask so, him. So, um, you know, lots to talk about, you know, as far as, you know. And then all the way through, then has got, and, and may, I mean, and, and then after 10, I mean, it's like he's, he'll probably be writing a song while we're talking to him. He, you know, he clearly just never stops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the way through to McFly. And then this yes. amazing partnership with Andrew Gold, yeah. who, you know. And recently he's been playing with Ringo Starr. Yeah. Never stops, does it, for this guy. I think he's 77 and it just keeps, you know, it's more power to him. Let's get him on. Welcome to the Rock on Tours. Okay, guys, I'm ready. But it's a big tune for sure. I actually wrote that originally for Tina Turner. Of course, I had gone and found Joni Mitchell down in Florida and brought her back. I've listened to a few of them and they've been really good, man. I'm sitting in the back of the car coming into London. They're brilliant. That caused a big problem in the band, actually. I was having too much fun. Thank you guys for still being around, still making music, still being into it, and doing this podcast. It, it's uh, it's fabulous. Well, I get the feeling that us three should go for a pint. That's what I think. I'm in a band now. <laughs> it's called Roxy Music. You know this thing about the 10,000 hours of experience? Oh, yeah. To, to get good at something. Yeah. When we recorded Arnold Lane, we'd done about 50 hours. The Rock Hunters podcast with Gary Kemp and Guy Pratt. Keep on rocking! Hey. Hey. Hello, Gary. Good morning. Hey, Graham. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Hello, Graham. I'm Guy. Lovely to meet hello, you. Hello, Guy. Guy, have we met? Well, I think we might have said hello at a sods thing. Right, OK. Uh, but other than that, but you have always loomed large in my life. I'm a bass player. But, 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 right. And you've always, since day one, you've been there, mate. So <laughs> oh, it's thank you very to much. Get to talk thank to you. you. An, an admirer of your work too, oh, I have well, to say. You. Thank you so much. Oh, right, bass players. Thank yes, you. yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's first great because I've only ever seen Graham really playing guitar because that's that's kind of most... I mean, when you're out with 10cc now, is it just bass or do you do... do you... Uh, I play guitar as well, uh, uh, but mainly bass. Mainly bass. Yeah. Now, listen, I, I would consider myself a guitarist, really. It's, yeah, I was going to say that because, Graham, this is something that, you know, as a bass player, I find because you are a great bass player, and, you know, you've always been the bass player in the band that you're in. Yeah. I know that's not what you do. You're basically a self-contained band in yourself. But I, the fact you never really talk about the fact you're a bass player. It's like you're almost, it doesn't sort of seem to mean anything to you. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but isn't McCartney like that? allowed McC to. McCartney's the same. He doesn't talk like a bass player does he? he talks like a songwriter and front man uh, yeah and a guitarist i think you yeah. know i mean that's how we all i think well a lot of people i know who play bass started off as guitarists i i, I got into bass playing because of uh, out of necessity really but uh, and but absolutely love it but have you ever written a song on a bass i think i have started like with a, a bass uh, a riff on a on a bass guitar and gone from there yeah but have you, or there's always that thing of even if you're playing the same part as the guitar and the same rhythm, there is something trickier about singing and playing the bass than singing and playing the guitar. Yeah. Do you find? Yeah. Actually, one of the, uh, one of the trickiest things is um, Things We Do For Love, which is a very sort of syncopated doom, doom, get doom, mm -hmm. boom, boom, kind of thing that is, it's definitely. Like it got me, took me quite a long time to get used to that. Patting but your it's head natural and now. rubbing your tummy. Yeah, no, yeah, it exactly. Is, it is, it's a, I always have to pre playing guitar and singing. You could just do it straight off the bat. Playing the bass and rehearsing, playing the bass and singing. You always have to rehearse. Oh, you've got it so much harder, haven't you? Oh, you have no things. idea, Gary. You have no idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Graham, before you came on, we were talking about your um, your history pre ten cc, and it's bloody incredible. I mean, it's just. The songs that you've written that are seen as some of the greatest rock and rock songs, you know, the 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 absolute sort of bedrock of of where classic rock were ended up. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, 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 it for your love and heart full of soul, and and to a certain extent, bus stop as well. You know, it's it's uh, you were just a kid when you were doing this, weren't you? Yeah, and it's only in in retrospect that I sort of guess I I realised the. Um the importance of it you know it's like when you're in it you don't realize how big it is in a, in a way or how important it is not like important to the world but important to yourself you know it's only in retrospect that now we're talking about it it's all these years on that it's still those songs still resonate and um 
you know, I realized I was part of something sort of part of a music revolution in a way um, in, in what, what happened with that sort of explosion of what happened with the, in, in the sixties led by the Beatles and us all following behind in a way. Also, because that notion of, cause you were right there at the, at when that kind of notion of, of what a pop song was changed. And it just seems incredible. It, like, into, if you think of what a pop song sounded like in 1964 compared to six, like, you know, from, say, Bus Stop. Yeah. You know, well, I, to, I, I always think of it, I, I always think of it in these terms. Like, you, you'll, you'll both understand this as musicians. Up till a, a certain point in the early 60s, everything was uh, sort of C, A minor, F, mm. G. Right? Which damn, is, damn, uh, that's my favourite four. Well, no, nothing wrong with it. Absolutely <laughs> nothing wrong with it. Well, I wrote true, my first true song. is not far <laughs> off. <laughs> it's not far <laughs> off. Right, you did use it. To good effect. Um, but what happened to me was I heard The House of the Rising Sun, and it was A minor C, D, F, which to me was like the opposite, the reverse, and the flip side, the dark side of C, A minor, F, G, if you like. And I'd always been drawn towards sort of minor keys anyway. And that I use that particularly the, the sort of um, A minor to C uh, in a lot of, or E minor, well, e minor that's for to your, G. Well, for your love is the for same, your isn't love. it? No, no, milk to, no Milk Today has that change as well. A, a lot of my songs had those changes. No Milk Today, which is a lovely pointer towards your lyrical style the way that you you would say you would find a, a line would stick in your head yeah. which might seem mundane but becomes because like you because you, no milk today is it is sort of redolent of that whole kind of kitchen sink angry playwright <laughs> well it's funny yeah but <laughs> so, I, I have to i have to credit my dad you know my dad was very helpful to me uh, during those the 60s when i was writing songs for the hollies and the yardbirds and hermes hermits um he was a writer. He wasn't a professional writer, but he was certainly good enough to be a, a professional writer. He wrote plays, articles for newspapers, um, and lyric. What was it? What was his Ham, name, Graham? Hammy Goldman, my dad. Oh, and okay. was he Jewish? Yeah, he, 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 yeah. <laughs> well done. Sorry, I heard that. <laughs> um, and uh, my dad was very artistic uh, and helped me with the lyrics. And it's, it was actually no milk today <laughs> came from him. Um, the, wow. the, well, in fact, you called him Heim the Rhyme, didn't well, you? Well, yes. To... Uh, it's actually, Kevin in the band, you know, he called him Heim. Let's call Heim the Rhyme up. Because that is a very much a trademark of yours, is like, uh, is the interesting, unusual and intelligent rhyme, isn't it? Yeah. That's something you clearly love. Well, I think, you know, I've always but... been interested in writing about, I mean, I've, I've certainly written, you know, the sort of standard sort of lo love songs. Um, but I guess that myself and and certainly with 10CC, we tried to avoid the uh, avoid the, the cliches, if you like, for for a long time. But but well, I'm not in, I'm not in love. Exactly, is the classic. exactly. Avoid, I mean, we, with the that, we, you know, Eric and I talked about right. I said we could write the perfect love song, but we don't want to write anything that is a cliche. And uh, I mean, Eric came up with the perfect title, and everything sort of flowed from that. Wonderful. But with No Milk Today, my dad actually, he gave me that title. He said he'd been round to see one of his friends and his friend wasn't in. He turned on the doorstep, saw the empty milk bottle, came back to me and said, I've got a great idea for a song, No Milk Today. I told him that was a rubbish idea. And he said, <laughs> you're missing the point. It's not about the fact that people don't want milk that day. It's what the empty milk bottle represents. You know, he saw it, he went, he went much deeper into it. The fact that, you know, the, the the bottle stands for lawn, a symbol of the dawn. Is such a great line. It's, oh. it's, it's, that is poetry, you know. It's, it's poetry. Just jump back to the beginning, only because I want to get to something here. Um, it was because you, you, your moment was you went to see Cliff Richard when you were 10, yes. weren't you? And your dad. And so, in fact, if with your permission, um, and Gary, if you don't mind, I'd like to read the first stanza of a poem by Jaime Goldman yeah. called Cliff and the Boy. Yes. <laughs> we all have heroes to worship from afar. My son had one when he was just 10. His name was Cliff, Cliff Richard, the pop star. And when his idol came to town to give a concert at the Free Trade Hall, he played and pestered me for the wherewithal to buy a ticket so that he could see his hero in flesh and blood. Now I tended to be iconoclastic 
and preferred the sound of Brighouse and Rastic. <laughs> but I couldn't deny him this pleasure and joy, remembering that I too was once a boy. Oh! Yeah. That we actually and it, and it got the, uh, wait a minute, but the whole the par- maybe I'll, I'll post it somewhere. It goes all the way down and goes all the way through your career. And I'm just going to read the last one because this is what a beautiful thing to have from your dad. Writes a hit into the chart. It goes. Watch it climb up and up and up. It reaches the top as do many more. Then come the prizes: gold and silver discs galore. Was it Cliff who opened the door? Yeah. Wow. Well, there's the question. There's the question. <laughs> Um, oh, can I say uh, it, it's beautiful <laughs> and uh, when my dad uh, passed away in 1991 I wanted to put together a book of his work nothing to do with with things that you know lyrics he'd written with me um, but we actually found that poem um, so he never showed me that oh. when he was alive oh. but what a find that was it was beautiful yeah. absolutely beautiful uh, was it Cliff that opened the door? Well, he yes, I guess it was. I mean, there were prior to that, uh, not exclusively, but like I, I'm going to guess that like you, I, I think I'm a bit older than you, but even so, people like uh, the Everly Brothers, Little Richard, yeah. uh, Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, um, Chuck Berry, yeah. you know, those were the pe- uh, uh, Then the Skiffle era, of course, which isn't talked about so much with Lonnie Donegan, which really inspired a lot of us. I remember being at school. Let's just get anything. Have you got a guitar? Yes. Can you play it? No, never mind. Just let's make some noise together. Uh, Then, I mean, Cliff and the Shadows were absolutely massive. Uh, I mean, and those records are still great. I'm I'm a mad Shadows fan. And we get have the honor to sit with the Bruce and Brian as well on occasion, don't we, yeah, Gary? We do. Do you, we do. Did, did, did you? You never came down as a kid, I guess, to to the Two Eyes Club. No, no. Did you ever? So, but you. So you saw them up in Manchester. Yeah, yeah. That was the only time I never. I, you know. I'd just like to interject one little thing, Graham. My one little thing here, yeah. as we were on dad, because my dad co-wrote "Rock with the Caveman." Oh right, great. Tommy Steele. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> Were you playing by then? Did you have a guitar in your hands? I mean, what was this? The, okay, was a, a, uh, well, my, uh, my musical journey briefly was at seven, I became uh, very aware of music, I fell in love with music. I wanted to be a drummer. My mum had a, a handbag that had like a serrated surface, and I used to use the clothes brushes to sort of go... And I did have some drum lessons, but it was not to be. And although I still love drums looking at drums and drummers. I was bought a guitar by a cousin of mine, bought me a guitar that didn't cost him a fiver when I was 11. And that, as soon as I held it, I thought, that, that's it for me. This is, wow. this is my, I'm going to be married to this uh, instrument for life. I love what, it. what sort of guitar was it? Was it a Spanish guitar? It was a guitar? Spanish guitar with a really high action, yes. hardly playable, and yet it was wonderful. And the funny thing, and because and we all had the Spanish guitar, didn't we? And it, it was, it's such a fat, yeah. flat finger. Yeah, why? When so you actually, wide. the first time you pick up an electric guitar or something, like, you're like, oh my God. Yeah, the joy. <laughs> this is easy. Yeah. Yeah. But were, were you playing other people's songs then? Yeah, we were just, uh, I, I started forming bands when I was about 14 and just playing covers, yeah. Just doing whatever was in, I can't even remember what they were, but whatever was in the charts. Do you remember that first song that you wrote? I remember, I rem- I, yes, I, I do. I, I, listen, I think about it in, with a little bit of horror, but it was so naive. But then that's what one would expect. You know, I think I started writing sort of when I was about 17, 18, um, really simple stuff. But then when I was 19, I, had, I wrote the first song that became a, became a hit. <laughs> Why did you start writing? Was it because you were just, you didn't really like the covers you were playing or always heard that? I was really in inspired, anyway? like me and millions of other people inspired by the Beatles. Yeah, right. Suddenly it was, well, we don't have to go down to Denmark Street and go around all the publishers to find a song. I was in a band <clears throat> at the time with, with Kevin Godley called The Mockingbirds and um, we did mainly covers. Um, no one would give us a song, so a combination of necessity and inspired by the Beatles, uh, I started writing seriously. 
And how was it? And how did you meet Kevin, by the way? Were you at school? Kevin, uh, Kevin uh, Lalcream and I all used to rehearse at a place called the Jewish Lads Brigade, which was like a social club in North Manchester. And, um, you know, they arranged sports, social events, did lots of things. It was a really buzzing, fantastic place. And did you have punch ups with the Salford Lads Club? <laughs> <laughs> I only know that because it's been immortalised on that Smith's album. Oh, right, that's Cover. right. That, the Salford's Lads Club was a long way away from uh, where we were. Um, but the deal was that the, the, the club allowed us to rehearse. In, in, they had lots of different rooms there uh, in exchange for us playing at their uh, social events. That was an excellent deal, I must say. So that's where I met Kevin and Lance. And was was there an immediate rapport with them? Did were they already a songwriting team, or did they have any? No, no, they were they were just playing in in bands. I think when I first met them, they were in separate bands. But I was in a band called the Whirlwinds, and we were doing sort of very doing lot sort of cabaret circuit in a way, and doing lots of covers and kind of old fashioned songs. A few, you know, we had a, a manager who was. Um, used to go to Italy a lot. So we used to do a lot of Italian covers, like Romantica, um, some of the fa- – I can't remember the, the, the titles of them all. But it, I got actually got fed up with it all and decided to form another band. And I'd noticed – I'd heard Kevin playing in this other band and, and thought he was very, very good and uh, said, listen, I'm going to form another band. Do you want to join with me? And that was the Mockingbirds, which actually contained half of 10 CC. Did you get signed? You got signed by George O. We, we did get signed, and everything we recorded, whether it was a cover or a song that I'd written, did absolutely nothing. Was it Gromowski? But every song that I gave to other people was a hit. Amazing. Did you have to go to London for that to happen, or was there any were there sort of business people? I think in we had business Manchester? people that that came up. I don't remember going down to London all the time to make that all happen. I mean, we did record in London. We recorded. Um, at Adv- do you remember Advision Studio? Advision, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did a, we did some recording there with Giorgio Gomolsky, who I'd already had a relationship oh, wow. with because of the Yardbirds. And he, he he did a record with us. Yeah, and then um, Kevin and Lowell had a project called Frab Joy and Runcible Spoon that came out on the immediate label, I think it was, which was something that Giorgio, Andrew, Oldham. Andrew Lover, Oldham, uh, uh, that uh, Giorgio was associated with. So, so Runcible Spoon, because Runcible is, is Edward Lear, isn't it? That's an Edward Lear yeah, made up yeah. word, isn't it? This was just some sort of mad But name already there's a sense of humour in the band, isn't there? A sense of yeah, irony. Of course. Uh, yes, and, and so um, Kevin and Lowell and I were kind of friends. We were from the same area. Um, and now, now we've got three quarters of 10 CC. Seven and a half. Yeah, if you like. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> let's just mentioning Giorgio. Gomelsky, because he was famous. Was he at the Railway Tavern? Wasn't that guy? Have I got that all wrong? That was he, the, where the Yardbirds he managed, played there, didn't they? Yeah, he, he managed the Yardbirds. Yeah. yeah, he managed the Yardbirds. what club did he look and... after a club as well, didn't he? Uh, uh, wasn't he to do with the Il Piano? Was it? No, it wasn't. Richmond Hotel was the Stones. There was the Il, Il Piano. I remember Kluke's uh, The Ricky Tick Club. Yeah. Um, I'm sure our listeners will know. It's, this is all the stuff. I mean, this was this used to be like my history lesson. I read it in so many books, you know. And John, Long John Baldry, Cyril Davis. That I saw um, all those. People, Alexis yeah, Corner. Alexis Corner. <laughs> I remember all whenever I used to come to London, I went to the clubs and was just blown away. But I actually saw the Yardbirds came up to Manchester a couple of times. Once we- get that. How did you get the song to them? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's... my manager at the time. Uh, Harvey had this, So you had a manager? <laughs> had a manager, yeah. Uh, Harvey was very important uh, in, in my um, starting off my career. Uh, he managed Herman's Hermits and he lived around the corner from me. He'd heard I was writing songs, I don't know from whom, and he came round and I was working in an outfitter's shop at the time. Uh, start, I'd started writing songs, eventually got the sack because I was playing with the Mockingbirds quite regularly so i was coming into work late or leaving early to go and do a gig got the sack harvey started paying me like a retainer just to you know like a small wage he said why don't you just write songs all day i thought okay I'll do, i can do that my, my parents were horrified at first but had, had always been very supportive of me 
And like within six months, I, the Yardbirds had recorded uh, For Your Love. So it worked out quite well. That's amazing. Quite yeah. well. Yeah. So how did you, so did you, did you do the demo and then? Okay, yes, yeah, so I did the demo. And what happened was Harvey was a, um, he was a big thinker, okay? And a lot of the ideas were absolutely non ridiculous, but some of them were very good. And he said, I'd written for you, he said, I think we should get it to the Beatles. I said, I think the Beatles are okay, the songwriting department. <laughs> now, although it was a stupid idea, it did lead to um, the publisher saying, that ain't going to happen. But by coincidence, the Yardbirds are supporting the Beatles at the Hammersmith Odeon at a Christmas show. And they're looking for to kind of go commercial in a way. You know, they, they decided they wanted to um, stop being just a pure rhythm and blues band and do something that might get them some chart success. I mean, they were wonderful. But it is extraordinary that, that if anyone who knows the Yardbirds historically basically knows them through your songs, and the funny thing is, is wouldn't actually know them as an R&B outfit at no, all. No, possibly not. But I, I, I yeah. have the, the honour of seeing them both with Clapton and with Jeff Beck. Um, anyway, uh, the, the song got to the Yardbirds, and Paul Samuel Smith, who was the the bass player and, and produce and really the, the musical sort of looked after everything musically for them. Um, he said, I think this is great. And they recorded it. And then. Have you got that first demo still? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever released it? it what would you have recorded okay, it on? Would we, we would have recorded it. This was pre the, when we started Strawberry Studios. Um, it would have been done at like a demo studio. I think somewhere in South uh, Manchester we did it. Uh, and there's the bongos are on it, but there's no harpsichord. I thought that was a touch of genius using the harpsichord. But I I did play an acoustic guitar um, on on the on the original demo. So when you say there's no harpsichord, no bongo, but is there? A yeah, band there's a band arrangement. Band yeah, there guitar? are bongos on it. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, there are bongos on it. Yeah. All oh, right. Um, but they first of all doing the putting the harpsichord on it oh, changed it dramatically. The, the, obviously, the sound sonically. Um, and there were various other changes from the demo. So they did, there was a lot of their, some, some songs that I've written, the, 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 the uh, artist's record are very much like the demos, and some of them are not. And the Yardbirds in particular did change things a lot. But I heard Brian Auger turned up. Uh, to play, yes, to Brian play, Auger played To play the piano, and there was no piano there. There was just a harpsichord. And he thought it was ridiculous, yeah. but he put the harpsichord on. Because it sounds like it's one of the first records, actually, 60s records, to have the classic harpsichord. Yeah, I, I mean, in stories like that, there was no piano, so there, I played the harpsichord. You know, it's like, <laughs> how does this magic, isn't it? You, you, couldn't, you couldn't have gone, if someone had said, oh, I think this would be a good idea to have a harpsichord on here, no one would have thought, would have thought of that. But it then became, it then became a 60s thing, didn't it? I mean, there was that TV show, the rank. It became a truck. It was a very TV thing. It was a very yeah, Ted yeah. Astley thing. Like that, that you have a harpsichord, a very fuzzy yeah. guitar, and maybe a bit of flute. That was, that was like, and, um, but also, but it had the, the thing of where it basically sort of goes into this middle eight where it basically turns into another song. Where did that idea come from? Oh, the middle section. Yeah. Uh, I, it was just a thing that I, I thought was a good idea. You know, I, I don't, I'm certainly not the first person to do it. Um, but, uh, I, I like the idea of, uh, why, why shouldn't it suddenly change and like into a whole different thing? But, but of course, there has to be some sort of connection between the two parts, even though they're very, very different from one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the legend has it, though, that it was, it was that song that made Clapton leave, which because he didn't want yeah, to become I, commercial. I think, yeah, it, I don't think it was. I think it was the last straw, basically. I think he was uh, not happy with the... He, he, first of all, he wasn't happy with the them changing direction he you know he was a real blues purist at that time and they were going for a what he considered a pop song which i don't i've never thought of for your love as a purely pop at all i no. think it lives in its own own world yeah well and it's a it's a sort of proto rock yeah. song it's, it's like bridging that gap. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's up there with, it's with a, it's a, i was going to say that it's a proto rock song. it's up there with my it's up there with my generation <laughs> as, as being you know, oh really classic right yeah, thank rock you. Song. but you had the privilege then of course of your next song 
having Jeff Beck on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, the, the greatest. God rest his soul. What a player. And, you know, they originally had a, because it has a very sort of Indian feel to it, that, that opening riff. And um, they had a sitar player in. But you, you must have worked with a lot of classical musicians. A lot of them don't understand the sort of like one, two, three, but one. You know, they're just, I don't know what it is. Um, but the this um, sitar player didn't couldn't get the, the feel of it at all. Um, and Jeff said, I, I can do that, of course. Did he? So he played it. But it does seem quite a funny thing to do to get in any player of a stringed instrument in yeah. that band, <laughs> which is all about guitar. Yeah, I know. Chords. Yeah, it was a, it was a brave uh, brave move. But uh, so dump the dump, <laughs> yeah, dump the harpsichord. Let's get a sitar. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, there you go. That they, they, they were they were quite uh, uh, experimental with their production wise. I have to say. Oh, and didn't you have a funny thing on top of the yes. pot? With, with the yard bird. With, with the yeah. mockingbird. So, yeah. yeah. Well, in fact, two bird, and you, you were in another bird. Yeah, band, the mockingbirds. Right? Yeah. Well, what yeah. is it with the birds? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The, the mockingbirds were a, um, you know, we, we uh, uh, sometimes were invited to the Top of the Pop studio, which was in, in Manchester oh, ori- originally. I didn't know that. And a, a, it was a converted oh. church in uh, Dickinson Road in Manchester. I remember that for some reason. Anyway, but one time we were on, I think we did it two or three times. You were the the warm-up act, right? You were like the warm-up, yeah. So they had to set up the lights and cameras and everything else. So to keep the sort of invited audience entertained, we'd play a few songs. And on one of these occasions, the um, the Yardbirds were um, were were actually on and doing "For Your Love," which was great. And so people have said, "Didn't you feel weird, or wasn't it odd?" You said like you should have been doing it. Said so, no, I was absolutely not blown away. It was brilliant. Did you go and introduce yourself? Did but did you do it yeah. in your warm-ups no. there? <laughs> did no, did you did introduce not. yourself, Graham? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. You know, it's a very vague period. I did sort of meet them and talk to them uh, only on one occasion. I remember meeting them in a in a pub in in London, and but I was a very very shy boy, and I, I don't know. I just felt really w- weird. You know, they were like. Wow. Uh, you know, it was the yard burst for God's sake. Yeah, but you think they'd want to come up to you and go, "God, man, you've you thank you for my career." I can't actually remember that happening. Other artists have who have recorded uh, my songs, um, but I don't remember that. But I have no, I have no problem with, with that. I was just honoured to. I mean, I was a massive fan of the Yardbirds anyway. So to have them record one of my songs, or to, actually three they did, or by, by by I guess eventually they started writing themselves. Like Shape of Things was that? Yeah, one, you know, when Shape they, of Things. Yeah, uh, I learned from you. Well, even that because that has that thing of of two of two different, very different sections. Yeah, like different they did. They were. I think they were inspired by that. I mean, I'd obviously heard it somewhere yeah. else. I mean, we're always. I don't want to say we're. In, I like to use the term. I was inspired by, rather than I stole that idea. Yeah, of course. And, and how did uh, your relationship with the Hollies come about? Because you wrote "Bus Stop" for them. The Hollies were um, managed by. They were actually in 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 Stockport, sort of south. Their manager. The, I think that's where they were based. So their their manager, a guy called Michael Cohen, had a shop called the Toggery. And the Hollies used to go in there. That's so sexy. Yeah, yeah, the toggery. <laughs> it's great, isn't it? Um, and they'd heard, I, do you know, I've heard different stories and I can't remember. The Hollies had already recorded Look Through Any Window, which, which they got via our uh, publisher. And then they came, they came, I think it was Tony Hicks and Graham Lash came around to, uh, my flat to listen to some songs. And I don't remember actually taking anything. I've taken one song, a song called Schoolgirl, which they did record. It, never, it was never released. But the main thing that happened to me was that the Mockingbirds were supporting Hollies at Stoke Town Hall. And they said, have you got any other songs? I said, yeah, I've written one specially for you. And they said, well, let's hear it. So we went into what I remember is like the smallest, quietest place backstage which was an actual because there was a lot of noise for some reason uh which was in the loo and <laughs> I, I played the bus stop 
and said that's that's great can you make a demo of it and send it to us? which i did and that that started that really that was a major thing for the hollies because graham nash has always that that was the that changed, song changed his life wow. because it was a hit in america wow so there would be no crosby stills nash and, and young or any of those if it hadn't been for you <laughs> taking can say? taking them in the toilet to play them bus stop i took him in the toilet so you saw yourself pretty much then, I would have thought, as a, as a songwriter for sale. Yeah, that, that's what you were yeah, going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I was very happy to be a songwriter. People said to me, "Oh, doesn't it, you know, irk you like with the Yardbirds at Top of the Pops that other people are recording your songs? You could have had a hit with them yourself." Well, I thought, "There's no, I don't, there's no guarantee of that." You know, I mean, I'm was massive fans of the Hollies and and uh, uh, Hermes Hermits and the and the Hollies. Uh, the Yard Bears, I mean, and um, I-, I was very happy for them to be recording the songs. And you're a bass player by this point, though, aren't you? Well, I've been the, a bass player, birds. yeah, for a long yeah. time because uh, I had a Revox tape recorder and I was, uh, you know, uh, jump, you know, bouncing tracks and making demos. And I wanted to have a, a bass on it. So I thought, well, I could do that. That's basically, that's the extent of your bass playing career. That's great. That's Yeah, that, that's, that's how it started. That. I need yeah. to bounce something but, on my Reeboks. But box. I'd already... Great, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd already, <laughs> I'd already um, you know, taking notice of, like, James Jameson, McCartney, you know, all, all the other great bass players and, and was kind of loved how important the bass is, as you and I know. So I was kind of a bit intrigued by it, you know. Guy texted me yesterday and he said, art for art's sake, man, that bass on the intro is incredible. Yeah, well, actually, that's not me. Ah! <laughs> no, hey, was it art for art's sake? Yes, or was yes. It another... Yes, it was art for art's sake. Yes, right. yeah, oh, it's actually oh. Eric playing my, oh. I've got a six-string, a Fender six-string bass, and Eric played it because we wanted more of a kind of a lead line thing. Oh, and it's a six string. That's oh, why it's. See, it's funny you say that because the because it reminds me of the way David Gilmore plays bass. That's quite funny. All right, okay. David's actually a very very good bass yeah. player. Yeah, but um, but so what? And because you've always played a Rickenbacker, haven't you? Well, the first bass I had was a um, a Precision, um, but I fell in love with the Rickenbacker mainly through McCartney when he. I was gonna that, right. That was my next question. Yeah, was it um, because of McCartney? So, yeah. That started me on with the Rickenbacker, but I, I never actually got on with Precisions, but I love jazz bass. So on stage, I use I use the jazz bass uh, with round wound strings and the Rickenbacker with flat wounds. So Graham, you go. You, that's, the cor- that's the correct answer. Is, is the right answer. Yeah. Thank you. So Graham, you, you go off to America, don't you, to, to sort of get involved in a songwriting sort of project? Yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, an interesting thing, this is sort of, I'd already become a partner in Strawberry Studios, which was started off by uh, Eric Stewart and Peter Tattersall. Um, wow, and then I went to America to work with uh, some people called Kaznets and Cats, who were famous for bubblegum music. Um, like, yummy, 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 I've got love in my tummy. Yeah, Ohio uh, players. Ohio Express. And, Ohio Ex- uh, Express, sorry. Ohio very Express. very strange them asking me. And, and I think the reason was they wanted to change their output and make it more sort of British, m- more mainstream pop. I don't know what, what their motivation was. It wasn't, um, artistically, it wasn't the greatest period of my life, but it did have a, a very important upside in that I was working. Well, you're in New York. I was in New York. <laughs> well, it wasn't that. I got actually was yeah. there for, I can't remember how long I was there for, but I got fed up there and said, uh, I've, I'm part of a studio in the UK working with some other musicians. What I want to do is take these songs and I'm going to do, we'll make the records in Stockport, it was. And that was working with Eric and Kevin and Lol on those records. So this is pre-10 CC. So although there were many other things that brought us together, that certainly was something that definitely brought us together in that we were in the studio making music together. This is long before. You were basically the first kind of gang of guys who had a studio back in this time. And I think this this feeds so much into why 10CC were the band they were. No one had that facility. No, uh, there's no, no doubt about it. Without the studio... Uh, there's lots of reasons why we wouldn't have existed, but one of the main ones was that without the studio, we wouldn't have existed. It was our playground. And 
boy, did we play. <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting because yeah. you say that you were doing bubble gum with, uh, you know, the Mindbenders, Ohio Express. Actually, you sang on one of those songs. Actually, I did find a funny picture because there's, they got a bat because there was no such band as Ohio Players, was there? And Express, I mean, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and they had to get a band in. And they got this band in, I think they were America, called Timothy and the Royals, which are totally Austin Powers. <laughs> when you look at the right. picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, so everything was like a lot of things that we know now. It was not the people that you see performing on the TV. It was session musicians in the studio. And then, you know, someone like, like the Monkeys, in a way, yeah. a, a kind of a, um, a, a, a manufactured band. That, or that, nothing wrong with the Monkeys, I have to say. But, you know, well, we were led to, the public was led to believe that uh, they were playing on the records. You know, what's interesting is that, that you, you, you say it's, you were doing bubblegum, but in a way, that's kind of what, happens on the first 10 cc album is it because donna and rubber bullets you know had a 50s pastiche feel yeah they're, but yeah we we, we love pastiche i have to say um but uh, you know it was i think the main thing was looking back it brought us together as to what became 10 cc and it was also good business for the studio it kept the you know it was it was important because how was this? Do you, you all had shares in the studio, or you know? How many... No, it was just myself, so like, uh, talking... myself, right. Peter, and uh, and Eric, who were the studio owners. We did eventually our agents, um, Kennedy Street Enterprises, who were the agents of Ten CC, right. got involved as well as the studio expanded. So is this where, where is Hot Legs already happened? The sort of you know when the Hot Legs around? happened while I was in America working with Kaznitz Cats. They had actually were experimenting with a I think a, a new four track that we had in the studio and Dick Leahy who was I think with Phonogram or I can't remember what label it was with happened to be in the studio it's one of those stories where he's talking to somebody in the studio and he can hear this Neanderthal man playing and he's going what's that it's a smash <laughs> that's when a and R man said I've just heard something it's a smash and anyway, he was he was he was right, <laughs> yeah. uh, and that became yes. Yeah, so Hot Legs had a big hit with Neanderthal Man. They were offered a tour with the Moody Blues and asked me to join to play with them. And that re and from then on, we just stuck together. It was the separation between the songwriting teams that was that was obvious right from the beginning, was it? You, mm, not Godly. really. I mean, um, we. I mean, a lot of the songs are myself and Eric and the other team being Kevin and Lol. But there are a lot of songs where we've, you know, Eric writes with Lol, I've written with Kevin, I've written with Lol, I've written with Kevin Lol. So it was mixed up. But they, if you look at the, the, big, the big hits, you'll see the sort of two separate teams. Well, it's, yeah, there was, I mean, it's, because you and Eric are the kind of very much the songwriters that, and the sort of more arch comedic stuff comes from the other two. But what I think is the great crossover is is that rhyming thing of yours, which is I think is so important, especially on the kind of more lol, yeah, and Kevin sort of humorous. Well, the lyrics stuff. were always well, clever, yeah. that, well, that stuff. clever lyrics. Yeah, no, the lyrics were always brilliant. I think the you know. the um, Kevin and Lol had written a lot of most of Rubber, rubber Bullets, but wanted a, um, a a bridge, you know, middle eight. I hate middle eight and the term middle eight, a bridge. I really, I don't because it means that it's got to be eight bars long. Yeah, yeah, it says yeah. it's got to be eight bars long. Bridge two. It could, it could be a middle ten or something. No, except well, just yeah, middle. It's I, just, that, I, know, I it's hate the American use of the that word, we, that we word use, bridge. It, you, we we all understand what it means. Yeah. Anyway, but um, so I wrote this this middle part to the song, and then but I did come up with a very good um, part of a verse that says. Um, We've all got balls and brains, but some's got balls and chains, yeah. which is in part of rubber bullets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, were the influ what what were the influences? I mean, was it Zappa? There was Zappa. There was Sh Steely Dan. Um, was that Steely? there was Steely Dan? The, the there were different influences. I mean, for myself, the the common influence was the Beatles. No, no doubt about that. Mm. But for myself, it was people like Burt Bacharach and Hal David, uh, Jim Webb. Paul Simon, you know, like the sort of the yeah. songwriting greats, really. Because you've always had that very interesting chord thing, which I think, which 
later on, which with, with Andrew Gold is the perfect yeah, match for yeah. that. Which so it's almost like which is people like Todd Rundgren, I would say. And yeah, kind of, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm a, I'm a. Cool anyway, man. I'm not. I don't. Want, yeah, no, you are very. And uh, your use of chords is absolutely fantastic. But yeah, for, so also I was going to say a song like um. Were you involved in the lyrics of Wall Street Shuffle? Yeah. Well, you, that was your song. That's, that was your that's song. so arch and so funny. Yeah, it's funny. It's, and um, it's funny and it's it's funny how it's still used because it's still sort of relevant, you know, to, uh, to today. That, Whenever there's a, some sort of financial crisis, it, that you know, they always seem to play it or there, quite often. Anyway. There, there was a feeling, mm. it looks as an observer, when you get to Sheet Music, which is your first sort of su- really successful album. Yeah. That that you and Eric had the singles and and Graham and Lowell had the album tracks. Was was yeah. was there was there, yes. was there was there a friction appearing in that? No, you know, we had a very for a long period had a very healthy relationship with each other artistically in that whoever wrote the song, we would never reject a song. It was like if you wrote it, if you think it's good enough, fine, we'll do it. However, I reserve the right to say, listen, I think, can we just change, can you repeat that that section again? It, it's a, it's like a waste. I remember saying that to Kevin Lowell so many times. That part is so brilliant. You've got to repeat it somewhere down the line. So we would help rearranging the song. We might suggest a different chord or something or, you know, and but all the production ideas came from the four of us. Basically, we'd adopt the song as our own. Whoever wrote. And the lovely thing is, of course, you can do all this in the studio. Yeah. Actually, just making the record as you go, which is must without be being amazing. charged yeah. because you own the studio. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So we we had that freedom. There was no there was no pressure like, oh, come on, boys, the next sessions and you've got to get out. I mean, we'd we'd often work in the evenings when no one else was it coming in. That was great. Yeah, because that's the point. Because what were you? What was it? Very much a working studio. Were, was there a lot yeah. of uh, outside oh, stuff yeah. coming in? Yeah. I mean, famously, we when while we were recording sheet music, uh, McCartney was in with it, with Mike McGear, his brother, recording an album in the evening, and we were recording during the day. So the control, the the studio was absolutely crammed with gear. You could hardly move in there. And it, all, McCartney all McGears, was around all McGears, McCartney, McGears, McGear, gear, um, and McCartney. Paul was around a lot, and you know, I think I can feel him. In, inside, although he didn't plan anything, it, it, the fact that he was around so much, um, I think that influenced what we were doing. Wasn't he playing drums on that album? Didn't was, there, was his drum kit set up? Did I? Did I there was a thing? drum kit there, but it, he, he, we actually used that drum kit on uh, Wall Street Shuffle. Had a very loose snare. Um, was it? Was it that was the, the days of that uh, that sound. Um, yeah, we used his Mellotron. Um, yeah, we nicked a oh, bit of God. Well, we didn't nick anything. Not the Mellotron that was that's on Sergeant He Peppers. shipped it all the way up to Stockport. Well, because oh. Mike uh, lived, Mike McGear lived in Liverpool, so he Liverpool, would. Yeah, they they just come in from Liverpool every day, so it wasn't that far. So was Lily the Pink recorded there? And it, no, no, it wasn't. No. Oh. But there were a lot of a uh, lot of great. You have to look at the history of Strawberry Studios to see who recorded that. Particularly, a lot of the sort of like people like Joy Division, the Smiths. Yeah, I said it seminal. So, it, it basically made that whole that yeah. whole you know post punk thing possible. Yeah. I mean, incredibly important in very the important. cultural history. And yeah. I, I actually, it, I actually uh, t- it attended an event in uh, in Stockport on uh, last Friday, which uh, Stockport is the town of culture at the moment, and. In their museum, they had an, ex- an exhibit on Strawberry Studios. And the amount of people that have recorded there was, I mean, I was even surprised that I didn't know half of them who had recorded there. So the studio became really important for, 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 for musicians in, in, in the north of England. Did you? I mean, basically, we set the studio up because we didn't want to have to come down to London all the time. Simple as that. Did you put the desk? But we in? wanted a proper studio, and it was. Did you put the desk in and all the equipment? Is it all your? Yeah, yeah, we put the. Yeah, we had, we had, but we've had a few desks in. There, I love but, that, but, don't you, guy? That line from Ten CC and you know Art Rock through to Joy Division, still doing Art Rock, you know. Yeah, and beyond the Smiths, I would imagine the Buzzcocks, the Buzzcocks. Yeah, the Buzzcocks we could there. Yeah, I mean, none more important than the Buzzcocks, yeah. really. Than. Because they were the linchpin. It was the Sex Pistols going to Manchester. That, when you know, when uh, did you let it go, Graham, the studio? 
Um, we, well, what happened was that Kevin, Lol and Eric decided to move to the home counties and uh, I didn't want to leave uh, Manchester. Um, Good on you. Uh, what, what, Good on you. <laughs> yeah. And, what, and um, we thought, well, let's open another studio, which became Strawberry South, which although was a, uh, ultimately a financial disaster, did um, produce um, the Deceptive Benz album and the Bloody Taurus album, which had um, Good Morning Judge, The Things We Do For Love, and uh, probably Holiday. most famously, Dreadlock Holiday. Yeah. On it. Uh, but what, what happened was that Kevin and Lyle left the band. Immediately, we sort of started to build the studio in, in, uh, in Dorking. They just had had enough. And, uh, but Eric and I, after much debate, decided to carry on under the name 10CC. Yeah, yeah. And then come up with a massive hit straight away. So that was lucky. We're, we're, we're yeah, talk, it's very nice. I, I, just, I just want to ask you about art rock because. You know, that's how, you know, you look the genre that 10cc are seen in. And and was this, was it something you were conscious of? That there was only so much art you can have that you might lose commerciality and how you played that game of, you know, a song like I'm Mandy, Fly Me or Art for Art's Sake. You, you couldn't risk that nowadays. You couldn't put a song You couldn't like do that. it nowadays. But actually mm. the joy of 10cc was we didn't write for you. We wrote for me. Mm. It was for us, it was for our own pleasure. And, and we never, ever took notice of any trends or anything like that. And we were lucky enough to, that what we produced, people liked enough to buy records of. And got played on the radio. And how, how, was it, because you stayed in touch, I know certainly with, um, with Kevin did yeah. you all the time. I mean, with, things didn't get personally bad, had they all? Uh, well, Kevin and all left, I, I was very upset. I'm still upset. Right actually, that they left because Kevin and I have talked about this. You know, we've remained very good, very close, um, how we could have handled the whole thing better. Maybe Kevin and I should have taken a year out or whatever, and we could have reconvened. But there was a pressure from the record companies to produce another album, which would make another tour, more rehearsal. They, they got, there were two reasons, really, why they left. One, they got fed up with this sort of constant cycle. It was repetitive, and I think they got bored by it. And the other thing was that they invented this attachment for the guitar called the Gizmo. The Gizmo. And they, were yeah. ve they made an album which ended up as being a, a triple album, and it was just taking forever to finish. And we needed to get on with recording 10CC, and it was like, you've got to make a choice, guys. And they said, no, that we're, we've had it. But Eric and I carried it on to great success. We've ju we've jumped ahead slightly because I do I do you know we can't yeah, have we you on without back. talking about I'm not in love. Honestly, you know, okay. I, I, you must be mm. you must be driven mad by it. But uh, I, 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 you know, <laughs> as, as you are, perhaps well, sort of yeah, the same yeah, thing. It's certain songs. You got to do it though, haven't you? Yeah, but I mean, obviously, you and Eric sit down and write this song. But who yes. com who comes up with the idea of, of the production? Because the production really was was so unique. Well, it was really Kevin and Lowell between them, I think. Uh, I think I think it was Kevin said, why don't we do it with voice, just with voices? Oh, what a great idea. How are we going to do that? We don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. So the idea was that we put a backing track down, do it with voices, and then because we needed something to, to sing to, and then take the backing track off, and we'd be left with all the voices. So we did the backing track, which was done very quickly, which was Eric playing... Uh, Fender Rhodes, me playing uh, rhythm. Well, that's a particularly lovely road sound. Yeah. It's one of my favourite road sounds. On yeah, we band. used a, uh, we had these orange sort of phaser boxes. Yeah. Uh, it, it was in stereo, that, so each channel out of the Fen of Fender Rhodes in stereo went to a, um, a you know, separate track. So that's a beautiful sound. Um, mm. Perfect, obviously, for the record. I played a rhythm guitar on, a, on a, an electric guitar. And Kevin played a Moog, uh, a Polymoog synthesizer on a kind of bass drum sound. And that was the track, which was going to be, the, the idea was to take that off, as I say, later on. But even when we'd done that, there was something, we could tell there was some sort of magic in the air. And then we started putting on the voices, which required us to sing each note, multi-track it, make a, a loop of it 
and and spin it back into the multi track. So, without going into too much detail, so that on the, I think it was done on sixteen track, we'd have like eleven tracks of ah. Uh, a multi, you know, of, of lots of us singing. 16 track? You're only on a 16 I, I track? I think we were on 16 track. And of course, and, and wow. did you literally loop the tape so it was going around and around? Yes. So we, like we, a melody. So we made a, a tape loop of the one of each of the 11 or 12 notes or however many we use and spun them back into the multi track so that eventually, so we had the backing track and then we had all these notes. And, but we needed to mix all those notes down to a stereo pair. Mm. And to but, do, then the, you, but then you have to play the desk like a keyboard. Exactly. Don't you? Right. So the yeah. four of us were on the desk playing, using the faders as bringing up these different notes at different times. It was a joy to make because, of course, that today, if you wanted to do that, you just get a sampler mm. and bang, you got it in exactly. immediately. Yeah. What was brilliant about this was we, we listened to it grow with each note. Mm. And there was this beautiful, with all of them playing, this wonderful clash of voices that was so amazing. And in fact, throughout the track, it never actually disappears. It's really, really low in the track. There's this constant ah, sound. Uh, you can't hear it, but it's, it's kind of, it, it's there. Um, but obviously you hear, it when, you hear it when they're playing. You hear it when they play, when the, the faders are up, but then it never actually disappear. And we, when we finished the recording, um, I mean, we knew we had something great. Didn't realise its commercial potential at all, but knew we, we used to turn the lights off in the stu- in the control room and lie on the floor and listen to it back, well, like a few times. We thought it was brilliant. Totally what? life changing. <laughs> life changing. And if anything, you, you were the absolute inheritors of, of what the Beatles had tried to achieve or was beginning to discover in studios yeah. from Sergeant Peppers. This was this was this was everything that they'd given you in a way, wasn't it? Correct. Co- absolutely yes, correct. Whereas normally you would rehearse a song in a in a rehearsal room, go into the band and record what you had already rehearsed, whereas this way we're starting from scratch, really. We had the song, of course, but the production ideas were just came and grew uh, while we were in the studio. There was no there was no preconception other than the voices. But of course, that changed because we you obviously still have the backing track on on the on the the record that, you know, because the way the studio was built, wasn't it? It was built. It was the first one where the studio, the the actual control room was big enough for you to all be in. No, uh, and, and no. Do so, or was that the that the next one? No, no, okay. no. We we had a we, there was a control room and a. Uh, I mean, we did a lot of recording in the control room. Yeah, you know, I I, I would always try and put the bass on as late as possible, um, because I always felt like the bass kind of got absorbed into the track as everything else was being recorded. And then you would might have to re-EQ it. Whereas if I put the bass on nearer to the end, it's a better sound. Do you know what? Funny thing is, Graham, because, you know, being an 80s boy, most of the sessions I used to do were towards the end of the recording, me in the control room yeah. with the producer, yeah. not out there with the drummer. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Because, you know. Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah. Um, how, Did you ever worry about translating that into the live onto stage, you know, how, how could you... It, 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 would never, it never inhibited us. We never said, well, we better not do that because we'll never reproduce it uh, uh, live. So, no, that didn't worry us. And how did you and do also, something now, like now that? We have, yeah, but how, yeah. We, have, <laughs> we have ways. Yes, but then, in those well, yeah, days... Yeah, now you do, but back then. Yes, exactly. Gary's making yeah. a very good point. How, how did you do it in those days? How did you get out and play those songs? Well, the only that thing that we've ever... Uh, well, we... We'd, we'd compromise. Yeah, we'd have to compromise and um, and prioritize what what we could do. I mean, we, if we like got four acoustic guitars playing, well, there'd only be one or none. Not... But I mean, I'm not in love. You could have used a Mellotron. You could have actually. Well, we could have done, but voices. actually, that was the, <laughs> really that, taken for that was the one yeah. track where we thought we don't didn't like the principle of using backing tracks uh, mm. live, but. Because there was no other way of doing it, we did. Yeah, and well, it was it was pretty much frowned upon, wasn't it? Yeah, like, I, I still frown upon it, but uh, there, I think yeah. that's an excep- exceptional circumstance. I think the uh, anybody would would. 
That's that's Kevin. All right, <laughs> Kevin again. <laughs> uh, anybody would would forgive us. Um, uh, for, for doing that because we want the listener, you know, the audience's experience the thing, to be the, the thing, thing is I'm not, I'm not in love stands up as a song, take all that away and just use, Correct. you know, I, you know, you play that on a piano or on a guitar. It's an amazing song. Well, I do. I do. I do an acoustic show called heart full of songs, which is myself and three other musicians where I do an acoustic version myself. And obviously there's no backing tracks or anything like that. But as you say, the song stands up on its own. And I don't know whether you found this, um, Gary, but, you know, if you've got a good song, that kind of the production ideas, it, it inspires great production ideas. And um, I, I'm Not In Love was one of those songs. And one thing I, I should say about it, the, the, the record that you know is the second recording of it. Oh. We did a, a previous recording of it in a kind of a bossa nova rhythm, um, almost like a Burt Bakery type, and it didn't work at all. And unfortunately, like everything else that we didn't like, that we did, we erased it. Yes, yes. Oh. We didn't want anybody to get hold of it. But that, that would have been a nice thing to uh, have. I remember being in a studio with Trevor Horn, and when he didn't want somebody, he'd just say, burn it. Burn it. Yeah, yeah I like that. Because he didn't have, because he, <laughs> he hated options. You know, he did, he wanted, yeah. Did. Yeah. And then, then you've got no, you don't have to worry about it anymore because it's gone. I like, yeah. That's we we bumped in. We bumped into. We just guy and I were in Australia uh, in the autumn um, with, oh, yeah. with Nick, and we bumped into Rick Fenn. I know, I know you did. Oh, yeah, you, you uh, because I was recently on tour with Rick. We did, we came back last. Uh, in fact, a week a week today uh, from a um, a Europe a three week European tour. Yes, and Rick told me about that. Yeah, lovely guy. Australia clearly suits him. He looks amazing. No, he looks great. And he's <laughs> he moved out there like over 20 years ago. But I mentioned yeah. it because so it, obviously... and, but he comes out, he's got, God bless him, he comes over here. For him, it's a commute, you know, to come over here oh, to, to play with the please. band. And he's he's fantastic. The, the thing is, we always do the same thing. He comes in the day before we're going to start. We go out for a curry that night. He falls asleep in the curry, and then I sort of bring him out. He uh, stayed with us. But, <laughs> and, then, but, and then the next morning he gets up and off we go. But I mentioned him because obviously he joined the band when you became really a two-piece, didn't you? After when... Yeah, yeah, after I, Kevin and Lowell left. Though. So we'd had um, Things to Do for Love was a hit, and we decided to go on the road. So Rick um, and Paul Burgess, uh, who made the deceptive bends with me and Eric. We decided to go on, on the road and Rick was in that band and was one of my oldest musical companions and friends. So I've known him since oh. 1976. Did the band feel very different? Because apart from, I mean, there are songs like um, Anonymous Alcoholic. Yes. Still have the sort of very arch yeah. kind of thing. But, 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 but it was, would you say you became more of a conventional band? Uh, I think it changed, and it cha yeah. we lost we, we lost fifty percent of the band. You know, it wasn't like well, we've lost someone who plays the drums mm -hmm. only and someone who plays keyboards only. Kevin and Lowell were I'm glad you didn't were, say bass. were, were okay. fellow songwriters, producers, singers, players. You know, <laughs> um, so it was a big loss. That's why. Mm. You know, it was debated whether we should have the right to retain the name. But anyway, we obviously did. And, um, but it did change. Yes, it felt different. But we were very determined to prove ourselves that we could still produce, you know, the goods. Well, was dread, dread well you were straight out of the blocks with Dreadlock, with um, uh, the things we do for love. Dreadlock. Holly, yes, the thing, yeah, things we do for love was love, yeah. I, the first, I can't, I think. Good morning, Judge, which was a sort of minor hit, but things we thought of was a big hit. And Dreadlock Holiday was as well, wasn't it? it was yeah, Dreadlock Holiday, number one. Number one. Number one. Number one. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, uh, what, one thing that's interesting about 10CC, we had three number ones with three different singers. Yes, yes. Was, Lol sang, yeah. um, Lol sang Rubber Bullets, uh, Eric sang um, I'm Not In Love, and I sang uh, Dreadlock Holiday. And uh, Ironically, Kevin has an, an amazing voice. And, and Well, I, I, you took the words out of my mouth. Ironically, to my, to my mind, Kevin has the best voice. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. voice. Can I make, I'm going to make one really, really annoying, pissy little bass player point. Oh, oh <laughs> if you must. <laughs> High no, dive. No, because... Because the playing, no, because I love your, your because your bass playing can be so iceberg, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Special mention for iceberg. Wow. Uh, yeah. Really, really love you. 
But on Dreadlock Holiday, what's interesting is how, because the line is great and suits the song properly, but it's interesting you didn't lean towards any sort of reggae sound on the bass. No. I, I, still with a pick and quite clipped. And yeah, quite well, tasty. I always play with, uh, I, I occasionally, if it's something slow, I play with my fingers, but really I'm a pick mm. guy. And so, yes, I know, you're right. You could. You didn't think to dial the bass up a bit, you know. I don't know. We didn't. It just (laughs) didn't feel. I'm sure we would have done that because of the, you know, how heavy and sub sub bass the basses are on on the on real record reggae records. But um, (laughs) if we ever remix it, I'll I'll see what I can do uh, there. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, thank you. And how was it? We'll do the guy. We'll do the Pratt mix. Uh, how was it with Andrew Gold? Because you formed this band called Wax, didn't you? Yeah, I loved Andrew. Andrew, um, we met Andrew because our American record company wanted us to work with an American writer producer. Andrew was suggested. I absolutely jumped at it because I was a big fan of his anyway, and he fitted right in with. You could see exactly yeah, why. Yeah, it fitted right. I must say, it's magic. And I love your writing together. Yeah, well, we did, we did an album, with, as far as NTC is concerned, we did an album called 10 Out of 10. There were three singles from that album, none of which, I have to say, were successful, but mm. those three singles were co-written and co-produced with Andrew, so that sort of proves it was a, it was a, good, um, mm. it, it, it was a good call. And it was especially good for me because... Not long after that album, Eric and I kind of fell out, and I'd had I couldn't take it anymore. And the first person I called was Andrew and said, "I've got a studio at my house, a little studio, nothing fancy, but do you want to come over?" This was after we, you know, he'd gone back to America. Come over and stay with me for a couple of weeks, and let's make some, let's have some fun, you know. And he stayed for about six months, actually. Wow. And that really brought us together. We And we, we did an album in my house that's never been released that has some fantastic oh, wow. stuff on it, I think. We put one single out called, uh, what was it called? I can't even remember the name. Anyway, I've got a senior moment there. However, we did go on to record a, an album with uh, Phil Thorn Alley produced. Oh, and we Phil. produced a, a sing- yeah, yeah. I, I know Phil very well. In fact, I've worked with him recently on my... I've, on a new solo album. He, co-wrote, he co-wrote Torn, didn't he? But, he did yeah, and, and produced it. So Andrew and I did this album, which produced a, a track called Right Between the Eyes, which was a big hit in Europe, not in, not in England so much, um, and went on to have a very, very happy both musical and personal relationship. I loved Andrew. Yeah, well, you wrote, wrote a very sweet song dedicated to him, didn't you? Yes, A Daylight. When he passed. Yeah. Yeah. Are they playing with Ringo? We have to talk about that. I mean, that must oh, yeah, that right. must be a fanboy moment for you, isn't it? A real yeah. fanboy, surreal. And um, I wrote a song about it on my. I, I put out an album in 2020 called the, the album's called Modesty Forbids. Don't mind me getting a plug in there. Absolutely. And the opening tra- uh, the opening track on it is called Standing Next to Me, which is about my time with Ringo and the band. And it was amazing. Wow. I got a call from um, his. Uh, tour producer who asked the staffed question do you want to join Ringo Starr on the all-star band yeah but no he said, <laughs> <laughs> yes please oh, who wouldn't and uh and it was a great experience working with Ringo he was charming he was funny does not suffer fools easily and a, quite a fantastic person I must say he's got Very so kind. much youthful energy I can't believe it I mean you see him now yeah, on he's, social media. he's a fitness fanatic he you know he oh. was all, always go to the gym watched his diet you know he's very very strong and sort of wiry he's all he's all muscle and when you're playing in front because he's so distinctive as a drummer when you're playing in front of yeah. him you could just you could hear Ringo Ringo I'm never I don't think there is a drummer that is so complimentary to the songwriter Absolutely, absolutely, and you know, occasionally you'll hear those those fills that only he can do, and it's yeah. like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I always wanted to be in the Beatles. Well, I was never going to be in the Beatles, but I came close to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. But that, no, it's true because I'm just last point on that is there are things like come together. He should actually have published. Oh, absolutely! Who would have? <laughs> amazing. And when you talk, I mean, he was very free. You know, talk. He'd answer questions. You know, nerdy questions. Uh, 
uh, he'd answer. And things like, um, here comes the sun, you know, his drum part on that. Did you work it out? Did you do this? He said, no, I just did it. You know, we think yeah. it's so complicated and so, because maybe we, you know, we can't conceive of it being that easy. But like anything, you know, what's easy to you is yeah. is impossible to somebody else. He's never he's never thinking, I'm just going to lay down the right groove for this. He's thinking, what is this song trying to express and how does it he, move? And he's listening to the melody all the time, isn't he? Yeah, he just knows. And instinctively, he does, he leaves the right spaces and fills in the right fills. One thing I want to touch on, Graham, for you is that, of course, you wrote two songs and on, on her fantastic last album with the amazing Kirsty McCall. Yeah, I did. Because I, I used to work with, I, I adore Kirsty. Oh, yeah. Friend. I used to work yeah. with her a lot. What a lot. I'd love to know your experience of working with her. Yeah. Uh, well, I loved her. I actually met her at a writer's week that uh, used to be organised. A Chris Difford thing? Yeah. Was it well, it the... wasn't, no, it was before that. It oh, was wasn't that one. They were organised by. Uh, EMI Music Publishing, who we were both published by at the time. Mm -hmm. And they used to have these weeks where they would take like maybe between 12 and 15 songwriters to uh, this sort of country house. It was called, I think it was called Huntsham Court. Huntsham Court, yeah. yes. In fact, Gary, you came and saw I, I did a couple of those. Okay, Chris, okay right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. and, and uh, I was partnered with... Um, with Kirsty one day with and with somebody else and actually not a lot happened the, the the third person wasn't nothing wrong with that the way that person wrote but there was something you know a lot of songwriting partnerships are to do with chemistry you know you can get the mm -hmm. two great writers together and nothing happens but with Kirsty it didn't happen but we sensed that there was something that we could do together maybe later on and w which we did and um I wrote um, two songs with her. One was called Treachery, which is on the Tropical Rainstorm album, her, her last album that she made. Tropical Brainstorm. Yeah, yeah, yeah Tropical Brainstorm. And, and, the, and, sorry, and, and the other song was called Things Happen, which was a, a B-side of a single. The, the songwriting day, I used to go around to her. She lived not far from me in, 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 in Ealing. And uh, right. there'd be a lot of chat and drinking coffee and listening to sort of samba and South American music going on in the background. And then we sit down and, and write. Amazing. And it was uh, wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. You uh, doing another album, Graham? Yeah, I'm in the middle of, well, actually, I've nearly finished it. I, I sort of get the urge to do one every sort of three or four years. So uh, I've nearly finished one now. It's what I call my very expensive hobby. But I, I love doing it. I love writing. I, some of the songs are just my, my on my own and I've, I've written with other people and I just absolutely adore the whole thing of, of writing recording uh, it's just wonderful so I'm very happy and, and is it with Phil Fornelli you're working well Phil is, and I have uh, we wrote one song which was very very beatly and I, I said to Phil when we were in the middle of it I said I think I know someone who might play the drums on this very beatly <laughs> 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 and he did. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh amazing. <laughs> Graham, it's been great having you on. Thank you so much. Great to speak to you, uh, Gary and, and, and Guy. I've really enjoyed it. Really, really lovely. I've really, really lovely to talk. And like I said, you've always loomed large. It's really nice to finally talk to you, Graham. Thank you so much. You know, it's a fantastic story, isn't it? Of this young kid with his, his supportive father and, and, you know, giving him, giving him song titles and being obsessed with, you know, the, the Beatles and then, you know, having all these huge hits and ending up playing with a Beatle. Now, that is amazing. I know. Yeah, you were getting very fanboy there, weren't you? At the Ringo thing. You are jealous. Of course I am. No, but what's so nice was the way he was talking about doing his albums now is that he's still got that same boyish enthusiasm that he had when he was literally a boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and accepting that maybe they're not all going to be hits, but I still have to do this is the thing. I wanted to make a point because when he said he, I, he calls it his very expensive hobby and uh, I would argue it might be cheaper than sailing. <laughs> um, I'd also say to our listeners, by the way, that first um, stanza that I read, if you just Google Jaime Goldman, it was like a very early entry. You can find there's that whole poem, which is called Cliff and the Boy. And it really is a lovely thing. Well, I mean, and the fact that he didn't know about it till after his dad had, had died is uh, what, what a gift, you know, from your dad. 
Yeah, absolutely beautiful. So. Thank you to Ian for producing today for Gimme Sugar. And, uh, and yeah, that was, I really enjoyed that. Um, um, I'll, I'll be yeah. seeing you soon, I would imagine. Yes, um, although I, you didn't ask me if I'd be performing. Was I presume that's some sort of It's the Songwriters doing. of Society of Distinguished Songwriters. Yes, it's our Christmas yes. get-together and uh, people have to get up. Some people can't sing a note, but they've written some of the biggest songs in the world. Don Black always hosts it. It's very nice. Yes, you used to invite yes. me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So needy. There was, that year I did, there was a year I did that thing. <laughs> oh, listen, I've got to get out of here. Um, it's good night for me. And it's good night from them. Rock on Tours is produced by Gimme Sugar Productions for Warner Music Group UK.